Welcome back. Today's a great day. Uh, it is a nice day in Iowa City. Last week I said that and it was raining. Today I actually have to shut the windows. It's nice, like the, the blinds. So that's at least positive, right? Sunny? Great for November? I hear people sound like a child. I don't know if the dad ears are going off here. Um, <clears throat> last week we did DCMs and you wanted more. So today is more DCMs. Um, I did give you a homework, homework six. It's uh, two, two analyses, two or three analyses, I don't know. I'm gonna teach you how to do some of those today. I'm gonna let you do it in blatant, which is an R package that I wrote to do DCMs, um, rather than M plus. But if you really want M plus, you could use M plus. We'll talk about M plus today too. Um, but today, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, you had your formative assessment, I gave you all grades on that already. Um, I wanted to mention just a few things about the differences between the models, right? Once again, DCMs swap the latent variable distribution from being <clears throat> normal or continuous of some sort to being discrete, right? And then when you add to DCMs, remember at the end of class last time we talked the monotonicity constraint, right? So that means when you take that monotonicity constraint, what you're saying is for an item that measures you know, a set number of attributes, anybody who has more of those attributes that they possess or mastered have a higher chance of answering the item right. That allows us, because every item we can say that on with the monotonicity constraints, that allows us to say that that categorization of mastery for the attribute means that you have more ability than the categorization of non-mastery. So when alpha is one, you don't have one unit more ability than someone with an alpha of zero, right? You just are, have more ability, we just don't know how much more, right? That sound familiar? Awesome. Today we're gonna to talk about the structural models of DCMs, and then we'll do computing. What's a structural model? If you don't answer this question correctly in class, you're gonna get it on your final. No. <laughs> That's right, something to do with the latent variables, right? Sometimes we call it structural model. That term comes from structural equation modeling. But basically, a measurement model is easy to define. It's where latent variable is in an equation with observed variable. A structural model can be just the latent variables by themselves. It can be um, where we see it in CFA or factor analysis or multidimensional IRT. We're talking about estimating the covariance or correlation among latent variables, that's the structural model. You can also phrase it in different ways. You could phrase it where you may have a higher order trait, which we'll get to after Thanksgiving break. Hello. And that would be a different structural model. Or you could phrase it as a um, series of simultaneous equations, like a path model. So those latent variables could predict other things. We'll talk about that a little bit more also. It's structural equation modeling, but we can do that also with IRT, no big deal. Maybe we'll talk about a little bit of that when we get back from Thanksgiving as well. Where's mine? She bought me dinner yesterday. <laughs> well, well, all right. You can buy us all dinner, that's fine. Just, just kidding. So when I say structural model, I'm, in this case, I'm just talking about describing what the parameters do. But you could use this in a structural equation modeling. This picture that you see here was back in uh, 2004. I wrote this in LaTeX with this something a package called PS Tricks. This was uh, analysis of uh, the paper's 2006. This is the Dino model paper, which also don't use Dino. Last year I said don't. Last week I said don't use Dino. Maybe a little bit more forceful than that. And I apologize for your wife. I didn't mean her. <laughs> don't use the Dino model. Death to Dino model. I should say that. <laughs> Dino should also die, even though I was the guy authoring that one. All right, so just, just a heads up on that. But, so I, I still feel compelled to apologize to you, Ahmed, and your family. I hope you know it's not about your family. I just, but I feel the coincidence was enough to make me feel guilty. So, um, this is a paper where we looked at 10 criteria of pathological gambling from the DSM. Right, so the DSM is a book that has, it's like a cookbook for why your head is all screwed up, putting it right, briefly right. Have you, has anyone ever gone through the DSM before? No, it's crazy. I'll bring it back after, 
I'll, I have it, I have an old copy in my office that I use for this paper. I'll bring it back. We'll just go through it. But I mean, you could talk about disorders like pathological gambling, uh, kleptomania, like everything that has a name has some definition in this book. And a lot of those definitions involve having a series of attributes or criteria that you have to meet. In pathological gambling, there were 10 possible criteria that you could meet. You had to meet five or more to be called a pathological gambler. Meeting a criterion is a discrete status. And none of the methodology up to that point looked at the discrete status for each of the latent variables. So this is what this paper showed up. But what you see here is a path diagram. And these are the individual attributes that a measurement model would measure. This is a higher order factor right here called disruption. These four or five attributes were thought to be disruption. If you read the DSM, it said disruption, dependency, and loss of control. These are sort of the higher order factors that show up there. So why I say all that is this up here is this a higher order structural model with three higher order traits. You can't see the other ones on there. But that's where the structural model comes involved. You may also see structural models where you want to go and predict somebody outcome with the latent variables as well. That shows up as well too. And I have the old Iowa slide style because I went to go change my slides this weekend. And I swear to God, I went through an iteration of Microsoft products um, failing on me. Like in this machine, I can't even open Excel. But like whenever you switch a slide style, you get the floating boxes that used to be headers and footers that aren't aligned anymore. I'm like, oh, forget it. So I tried to delete them. They wouldn't delete. I'm like, all right, forget it. You're just getting the old slides. At least the old slides. I did look at them, though. <laughs> um, all right. So in DCMs, we're going to talk about the structural models. Now, I want you to note that the structural model in a DCM is going to look different than the structural model in every other model we've done with the exception of latent class models in this class. Right? What does the structural model in a MERT model look like? What type of distribution are we talking about? Multivariate, Multivariate normal, usually, just the default. Okay, and that's because each of the thetas are univariate normal and continuous variables. So in the diagnostic model though, what is the structural model? What are the parameters of that? Turns out it is the proportion of people with each attribute profile, right? So these are the discrete latent variables we're working with. We know for a given Q matrix, if we have a Q matrix that has capital A attributes, there are two to the A profiles where each of the attributes are binary, zeros and ones, right? So we have this. Each one of those profiles has a probability. That forms our structural model. So in many ways, this lecture could have been given many, much, much at the same time that we talked about model fit with limited information, because we talked about the same distribution. Remember the distribution we used there? Multivariate Bernoulli. We have a multivariate Bernoulli latent variables. We're going to have a similar multi set of multivariate Bernoulli probabilities we're going to estimate. That's our structural model. What you're going to see, though, is that there's differing types of models that exist that show up. And that multivariate Bernoulli actually was one of the later ones. When people really first started doing a lot of DCMs, either they didn't have a structural model. When one of the Still, I sometimes see it in reviewer comments, but one of the bigger comments back in when I started with this is DCMs don't allow attributes to be correlated. That's incorrect, and we're going to show that today. People still say that because they don't recognize the, the structural model, but we're trying to change that. Right? <clears throat> but generally speaking, what you saw before were structural models that look like um, continuous latent variable models. But there wasn't a whole lot of before. There weren't a lot of models out there when I started. So, okay. Questions before I begin? The other thing I'll note is some of these are uh, dependent on the software you use, but we'll get to that in just a bit. These are the same notation I had last time, remember that? Key difference is alpha is now our latent variable, not theta. Could have left theta there, but I, I changed the distribution, so I'm just changing the, the, the symbol. Need coffee. Yeah? Yes, I have a quick question now that you mentioned something. So compared to mirror, now we are trying to see what's the probability of a correct response based on the latent 
the profile of person. Profile that that's right. students or people have. That's right. And in MERT, we were more focused on what the contribution of these different latent factors were to predict that response. Yes, sort of. Same thing. Same thing, right? Think of it this way. We have a profile of attributes in, in DCM land, these uh, attributes here, alpha 1, 2, and so forth. Right? In MERT, we have a profile of latent variables also. It's theta 1, theta 2, theta whatever. So with both of those, our item response model itself takes the latent variables or the profile that someone has and uses it to come up with the probability of a correct response for each item. And that's still the same. The DCM version of it, again, has more latent variable interactions by default. Right, so when we have more than one latent variable measuring on, uh, um, uh, sorry, one more than one latent variable being measured by an item, you might see a latent variable interaction that we talked about last week, you know, like the two-way ANOVA. But the same concept is there. The item response function is a prediction. If we knew what a person's profile was, we'd be able to predict what their correct response was. But this, this, that's the same idea. Yes. You're welcome. Okay. And the other thing I need to note is each profile is a latent class. That's important for today. Right? It's a latent class that we've defined. So this is a confirmatory latent class model, if you really want to call it that. All right. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before that attribute profile at the end of, uh, and we saw this in your homework, you saw this um, with M plus with the latent class models. There's the proportion of people in each class that's being estimated, right? That is, Sometimes they call that the base rate of the proportion, the baseline proportion of people with each profile. Um, that is the proportion of people in our sample that we estimate to have that set of profiles. But remember, from the limited information lecture, right? our attribute profile is now going to take the role that our big um, item response pattern probability took in limited information. Remember the target distribution in IRT that we talked about? I said, oh, what you're looking for is the proportion of people with any given permutation of responses. Right? Each item or binary, that target distribution is a probability to it. We don't we can't collect enough data to look at that. Right? But what we turned around and did was we said, however, we can show that if each of these each of these elements of the profile are binary, then this is a multivariate Bernoulli, and we can do things like look at first order moments, like proportions, means, or second order moments, and so forth, right? We, we came up with a series of contingents, two by two tables for each item, pair of items. Remember that? The same thing happens here. In a DCM, we've got a vector of probabilities. They align themselves with multivariate Bernoulli um, attributes in this case are latent variables and in that vector embedded in it are each attributes marginal proportions so if you're talking about the proportion of masters for each attribute by themselves and then the two-way tables include include the association between any pair of attributes which we could also convert into a correlation right you know a handy, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you remember a really good correlation to use for binary data, right? When you've got two binary items. What was it called? Tetrachoric. You probably will forever remember that now, right? We could calculate that, but it all comes from the same place. We could take this structural model and break it into its component parts. It doesn't look like correlations are in it, but they are, and we're going to see that real quick. Okay? So, those probabilities these base rates are the foundation of our structural model, and they represent the probability any respondent has any given attribute profile, right? So any person has you know, all zeros, all ones, or some permutation of that for the attributes, not the items, not the data, the attributes, right? Just straight attributes here. If we, could, if we could envision what a person knows and classify them, that's what we're talking about here. So there are two to the A profiles. Each one gets a probability. So we mentioned before that DCMs are these constrained latent class models. In the last class, I didn't really dive that much into that. I didn't think I showed this right here, but let's just break it down. Um, so here's our observed data on the left-hand side. And then we have our measurement component. By the way, this pi IC right here, that is the parameter from the LCDM. 
right? That, that becomes your LCDM probability, right? Before this was our latent class probability here, the pi IC follows, you, know, you use the, remember that helper function of alpha and Q? That's LCDM, that's what pi IC becomes. So I didn't show this last week, but LCDM is really describing the probability a person in class C answers item I correctly. But this term right here, eta sub C, is our structural component. That's where the probability, the parameters hold, are hold, held for those probabilities. And three weeks ago, or however many weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago now, when we first started talking about latent class models, this, I, what the, I swear I'm not touching. <laughs> I need extra patience. I'm just gonna take a deep breath. Rather than getting angry, I'm just gonna, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know? I learned a bit more, a bit more calmness in my life. Maybe, or maybe more coffee and just throw my, throw a fit every time it doesn't work. Anyway, never mind. This thing right here, eta C, that's our structural or new C. I guess that's a new right there. I had eta in my other slides. That's our probability. That's a vector. Each class has a probability. And three weeks ago, we told, called that the mixing proportion, right? The proportion of this class is distribution mixing with that class's distribution and so forth. And so tying all this together, just thinking of the words, this is a marginal distribution of our data. We are marginalizing across our latent classes, right? So the part in red here, the measurement component, that is the distribution of our data conditional on someone's class, right? So this is uh, f of y conditional on c, and this measurement component is just the distribution of the class itself, right? So what we're talking about here is this, this is our marginalization. We're basically summing across all of the, the parameters to give us the overall probability a person gets an item right. And this is similar. Um, again, when we talk about structural models, the first place that you hear that most likely is not IRT class, right? It's SEM. And in SEM, you'll have an item response function, even though we didn't call it that, right? You have an array, you have Y equals mu plus lambda, one, you know, lambda times theta or F plus error, right? That's our, so in SEM, you get this cor correlation or covariance of factors also, but you don't see it in the model equation. And you don't see it in the model equation for the measurement model for DCMs. You don't see it in the model equation for the measurement model for IRT models. And that's because if we really, you know, we don't have a place for it. It's measurement model. There's no structural model parameters. But you have to move out to the joint likelihood or the marginal likelihood here to really see where that parameter set comes from. And the same thing happens in SEM or in IRT. We just don't often talk about it. So that's why we're talking about it here. Okay? Because I always, here's why, why I'm telling you this, I'm going headlong into this right now. So every time someone tells me I'm estimating this parameter, I need to see it in my model equation. And if all I had was the measurement component from last time where I just had the LCDM, there's no probability of persons in each class in that. So where do these parameters come from? They reside here. And the only way you get to that is by looking at the distribution of the attributes themselves, to use in the marginal likelihood, okay? All right, so literally, the, the parameter vector is, or this is just the parameter for one class, eta or nu c, it's a, it's a vector, right? So if we have four attributes, there'll be 16 classes, there'll be 16 eta or nu c values. It's sum to one. So really with that sum to one constraint, we only have to estimate 15 of them, or one fewer than the number of classes that we have. Right. <clears throat> so that's what we have here. We literally can think of this as the probability that someone is in class C or has attribute profile C, alpha C. And here you have an example, right? There are 16 classes. This is the probability a person fits into each class. And then you have each of the attribute profiles after that, alpha one through alpha four right here. All right, so here's our probability. So what is this telling us, All right? That 21.2% of people have not mastered any of the attributes. Now, I'll, I'll put, I forgot to put my caution this week. When I say mastery, remember, that's not truly mastery. That just means it's easier to say, okay? What it should be, the high-performing group, HPG. Nobody wants that. 
I feel like I'm really like I'm like normally not funny, but you all laugh at me anyway. This week I'm especially not funny. I don't know. I don't know the energy's not there for me this week. Anybody feeling that? What? It's a week before break. Is that it? Thanks for the excuse. I appreciate that. It's not you, Templin. It's the week before break. Hey, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the break. Anyway, uh, proportion right here. 0.212 or 21.2% of people in our sample have no, mastered none of the attributes. 25.5 have mastered all of the attributes. Here's another one of 15.3%. Some get really tiny, right? Turns out that's really common. You may see attribute profiles that have very few numbers in them. And that actually causes a whole lot of difficulty in estimation of this, in M plus at least, in the way you parameterize that. But can anyone tell me what the correlation between attribute one and attribute two are for this? No. What if I told you it's in there though? Would you believe me? Let's think about it real quick, conceptually. I have these in my slides later on, but I'm gonna just walk you through the exercise real quick. All right? Let's imagine I'm looking at alpha one, alpha two. And what I want is a contingency table of the probabilities for each. Do you have enough information to fill in that table with this right here? For instance, yes, yes you do. This right here should be all of the probabilities where attribute one is zero and attribute two is zero. Well, it turns out right here, these four. Right. So the sum of these four numbers provides the estimate in that cell. Right. And then likewise, the sum of these four numbers, these four probabilities, gives us when attribute one is zero and attribute two is, that's that next set. Right. This would be like set one, this is set two, this is set three, and this would be set four. We could do the same thing with each. And why I'm mentioning that is you're like, wait, Jonathan, Templin, come on. There's no correlation here. This is a two by two table. But you know what a correlation would be for that, right? If I had a two by two table, what could we do with it? Could we use your algorithm to find its tetrachoric correlation between the two? Absolutely. Okay. Similarly, think of it this way. If I wanted the, prob the marginal probability that someone had mastered attribute one, how would I find it from these numbers? That's right. Thank you, Annette. Add up all the probabilities where attribute one is one. That's perfect. All right. So we can agree if we just add up the probabilities here, I get the marginal probability. Same thing with attribute two, right? Without loss of generality, if it works for one attribute, it should work for the other. We need to add the four that have the ones right here and the four that have the ones right here. Right? Cool. So guess what? Not guess what. What if I asked you, can you think of a matrix algebra result that would give me all four marginal probabilities with what you see on the screen here? I'm asking this because I know you've done a little more coding in this class. But if you have to code this and you're given a, a vector of marginal pro a vector of probabilities for the joint distribution, can you quickly marginalize it? Decomposition. What's that? Decomposition. Not a decomposition this time. I'm actually going to just call it a matrix product. Would it be like the first matrix is B, C, A1, and the second matrix is B, C, A2? Not quite. The close. You're getting there. You're getting there. What if we made a matrix of just the attribute profiles here? What size of matrix is that? How many rows? 16 by 4, 16 by four right? Yeah. And if I multiply that <clears throat> by a vector of probabilities, let's call it a row vector, a 1 by 16. Guess what happens? This vector is an element-wise product with each column of our attributes. And then we take the sum of those element-wise products, which means if we want to quickly get the marginal proportion correct, we take 
basically the dot product of that guy in each of the columns. All right? And if that happens, you can quickly get it. There. Kind of neat, right? I don't know if that's neat to you. I think it's neat personally. Um, so, and similarly, you could think about the two-way tables. If we wanted the two-way table between alpha 1 and alpha 2, we'd need something to sort of indicate which ones, which cells were showing up. Showing up. We could actually form them with just um, kind of quadrants of each of those vectors. But long story short, you quickly get that. But you see where we're going with this, all right? If we can build a two-way contingency table out of these numbers, like I did on my, my little uh, drawing here, then we can summarize that contingency table using measures of association, like a tetracorrelation or Cohen's kappa or any of the ones that you've learned about that are all, all important for some reason, but not all the reasons, right? You with me? So if I ask you, how is it, or better yet, let me ask the first question, the one that I see on reviews sometimes, review comments, do DCMs allow attributes to be correlated? Yes. Where are they correlated? How do you how do you tell that? If someone said, "Where's the correlation?" All I see are these probabilities. What would you tell them? It's the two-way tables are subsumed into this multi-way contingency table. This is a sixteen or a, you know a a four-way table effectively right here. But remember, in the multivariate Bernoulli idea, the one-way tables, the two-way tables, the three-way tables are all embedded in this same structure. So the answer is yes. Attributes have correlations. Those correlations are embedded in this structure itself. And this is the key to understanding structural models. We always have these probabilities right here. So yes, attributes absolutely correlated. All right. So. It's very difficult to interpret these parameters, but we can, right? In fact, let's just try it. I mentioned to you before the proportion of people within each class, right? 0.212. So let me, let me take a step back. What would this look like if we had almost perfect correlation across all of our pairs of attributes? Let's say every correlation is above 0.9 between each pair of attributes. What would these numbers look like if there was a high correlation? That would be no correlation, one, one over 16. One over 16 would be equal chances if we had none. But that's good, though. You're, you're thinking in the right direction. All would be either the first or the last. Yes, that's right. So when you estimate a DCM, one of the things you can check really quickly if you have you know, if your attributes are highly correlated, maybe too highly correlated for your own liking, or maybe you're overfitting the data, or better yet, generate data from a unit dimensional DCM fit a four dimensional Q matrix, what you end up seeing is the bulk of the probability in these two cells. Right? All zeros, all ones. And then you start to see layers of other probabilities. Like here's one right here where there's three ones and a zero, right? And then here's three zeros and a one, right? So. The other thing you can look at with this is the following. Take a look at all these attributes down here, right? all these probabilities down here. The one thing they all have in common from row 9 on the row 16, uh, actually let's go 9 to 15. 9 to 15, has no, but no, no cell has over 10% of the, the sample in it. And all of 9 to 16, have attribute one measured on it. So if you start looking at this, sometimes people start to think there might be something called an attribute hierarchy in my data. Right? What is an attribute hierarchy? I mentioned briefly last week. I don't have time to go into them in depth. But basically, the idea is this: if these are like educational attributes. If this is math, and some of some of the, some things are prerequisite to learning the others, you'll see a, a, a structure like this. Like. You to nobody. If nobody is answering, if, if there is nobody in our data or next to nobody in our data that have mastered attribute one without mastering some permutation of attributes one, two, and three, what this tells me is that perhaps you need to know something about two, three, and four before you master attribute one. 
right? Seems fairly reasonable, right? So what's happening to me, if I look at this, the first thing I wanna know is that indicating to me that you need to know at least one, perhaps all three of these before you actually master attribute one? I don't know the answer to that. But that's another thing you can derive from this structural model. That is really cool. I like that because now you've got these sort of catches. If you're interested in that, shoot me an email. I've got a couple, I've got a series of papers that, or two papers that one looked at it with a new model called an HDCM and then one applied an old model to it and showed some equivalence classes. But, um, <clears throat> That is the other thing to look at this for, right? So attribute hierarchy to be present. Now here's the fun thing, that HDCM paper I talked about, like if, you, if this is truly a hi hierarchy, basically these would be either a sampling error or other mis a model misfit that's showing up where we have non-zero numbers here, but they're close enough to zero. Most of the other estimates aren't biased. If you have too many classes, it just, you just get zero values into this vector here, which normally isn't a problem unless you are M plus talk about M plus in just a moment. How are we doing? Okay. So, apart from that, apart from looking at this and looking for meaningful patterns, it's really hard to look at those parameters because they're just probabilities. But instead, what we like to do is break them into those marginal tables. I even, this is how old these slides are. This is back when I used SAS. How many of you like SAS? How many of you have credentials for SAS? What's <laughs> I have the R code too, but I just want to show you this, right? What am I doing? Because this is actually an interesting data analysis problem. I tricked Proc Freak, and I'm going to tri trick the psych package to give me a tetrachoric correlation with just these probabilities themselves, right? But I'm doing that by looking at it this way. I have these 16 probabilities, and I have four different um, vectors of the attribute profile, right? Four different columns of it, right? And my goal is to figure out the correlation between column one and column two. However, my data are in probabilities. So the way I did this was basically, I decided that this eta, that's our first probabilities here, will weight a likelihood function for each person, right? So if I basically said, that's a weight of a likelihood, then each of these columns becomes data effectively. Weighted data, and I get my correlation out of it. It's a little weird to think about, but that's, with the mixture model, you can do secondary analyses with these structural model probabilities by using them as like rec, uh, replicate weights on a likelihood, a weighted likelihood function. We don't talk about weighting likelihoods in our class much. You see it in survey research if you sample uh, so we don't talk about it in this class at all, except for right now. In our program, we don't see it much. You might see it a little bit in NAEP, like how we go and do NAEP data with the sampling design that NAEP gives you, a National uh, uh, Assessment of Educational Progress that we give out in the United States, fourth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade, um, every once in a while, four years, I don't know. Anyway, but we're using these weighted variable analysis as a trick to give us the correlation, and it will do that here in the psych package, we do the same thing. I'm gonna weight by structural model probability right there. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool, personally. And here are, basically, here's for each attribute, though. Look at this. The weight gives us the, the frequency, right? So each, each proportion, this is the proportion of masters for each of the attributes that you can see there, right there. So attribute one only had 31%, but we, when we looked at that big profile, Right here, we also saw attribute one involved in most of those cells that were close to zero, right? So the sum of these would be what attribute one gives us, 0 0.31156. Similarly, though, we get a tetrachoric correlation. By the way, this is all, like if you use proc freak in SAS and ask for the, uh, all the measures of uh, association, and, and honestly, I don't have the SAS credentials that you have, so there's a better way to do this, let me know how. I'm not, I'm not trying to teach you, but it's, it's good. It's good to have more credentials, right? Uh, this right here is tetrachoric, but all these are other versions of association. If you take a categorical data analysis class the way that we used to teach it in the old days, you'll see a lot of this. I don't know that it's all that important, but we know our tetrachoric, we see our Pearson correlation. Not bad, right? Cool? 
So you can always turn a, ve a vector of probabilities into correlation. And I mention this to you because you've seen M plus. It only gives you the probabilities, right, for each class. So you can take those and work with them to make correlations, basically, is the main thing. Questions? And there's the output from Psych, by the way. You see that th this correlation, 0 0.7809, is pretty close to what that needs to be right there. So, not bad. These were uh, data from a different topic. I don't need to do that. <clears throat> okay. That's the structural model. That's it. We can do other fun things with it if we had the right software to do that. That's tough. Instead, we can come up with, let me talk a little bit about different structural models. All right. Um, one of the ways that we can go for this, we can turn them into log linear models. Log linear models are seldom talked about, especially in our program. Log linear model, the log linear was the term for the term for the model I showed you last week, log linear cognitive diagnosis model. By the way, that title came about because if you read the paper, uh, Bob, who led the paper, derived that model based on lo a log linear model notation. There's a big co connection between log linear models and just regular binary logic models as well. So that's where I don't usually talk about the log linear side, but here is one where we could do that, a log linear model. And I mention that because M plus, by default, uses the log linear model. Now it saturates everything, but we could build it in different ways. Um, we have a tetrachoric correlation model possible as well. So basically we could come up with a limited information structural model for what we do here. Now back in 2004, uh, Jimmy Dele Torre and Jeff Douglas had a paper about higher order models. Um, that also does this as well in just a little bit different uh, implementation. You see that as well. But this is basically, we didn't have that label back then. But what this does is it basically allows you to um, do limited information on the structure. Now, I don't think you should be doing the limited information for the structural model because you're throwing away stuff. Nobody wants limits, right? Anybody want limits? No, never mind. Annette wants lim limits. All right, Annette, you got it. Uh, you could have hierarchical factors also. You have mixture models. I did that before. You have Bayesian networks. Uh, there's a chapter I put up on ICON that had, describes a lot of these models. It's, I think it's still relevant. Not a lot of work gets done with the structural models because we do a lot more measurement than structural, but it's, it's good stuff. Good stuff to know. So let's talk about the log linear structural models real quick. Turns out each of those probabilities that we have, this is the, the new sub C, this is our probability of each class that we have here we could just take the log of it and now we have a model, uh, a number that we could model, right? Um, so here in M plus, this is actually already happening. Um, M plus takes the log of each probability, models it. You'll note that the probabilities have to sum to one. So what M plus does is it basically doesn't estimate one of those probabilities. It sets that, sorry, one of the, one of those Eight, uh, mu terms, it sets one of them equal to zero. It's the last classes. You may have seen that previously. In the output for M plus, this is latent variable means. That's where that section is. And when that's when we want to convert back to probabilities, we can just normalize it. Um, what is this called? Um, Stan calls it like a simplex or something like that. Uh, um, anyway, we take our probability, we divide by the total e to that number. So here's, for instance, the M plus output um, for this model. Class number 16 doesn't exist on here. That's because it's fixed to zero, right? So what ends up happening is we can actually go back and um, take that and model it. So here, I don't know why I'm going too much into this. If we really wanted to look into it, We could actually look at the impact of each attribute on this type of model. Um, basically, we can provide a linear model predicting the probability as a function of each effect. In this case, we don't have an intercept, but a main effect, a two-way or three-way interactions. Basically, describe the impact of each attribute on that probability. You think of it this way, looking at this table, it's weird to think about a log linear model. 
How many of you have learned log linear models before? Where? In a stat class. Yeah. Stat class. Anybody else in stat here? It's not where. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> Come on, Templar. I'm just joking. That was like that, that, that. I don't know where my head is. Anyway, log linear models are a trip. They're basically describing contingency tables and association between them. But you can do so in a way that looks at each of the effect of each of the um, variables that go into it. So what I mean by that is in this table, we could pretend these are our data and these are our predictors. If we did that, it's a little weird, but we now have a linear model that could have main effects of each variable, could have two-way interactions of each variable, three-way interactions, even a four-way interaction potentially. And all those, no, all those interactions and the main effects are doing is talking about the contribution of each variable to this whole overall prediction function here. But one of the things that it could give us, at least in the M plus world, is M plus has a problem with little probabilities because M plus by default takes the log of those probabilities. What's the log of zero? Come on. Like, we have all this math and we didn't define the log of zero. I'm just kidding. What's zero divided by zero? Also undefined. Oh my goodness. We shouldn't be getting rid of English departments. Maybe we should be getting rid of math departments. I'm just kidding. I love math. It's just this, like, it's undefined. I love it. It's like, yeah, I don't know what that is. Whatever. <laughs> we got math that describes the origins of the universe, but divide by zero? Forget that. It just breaks everything. It does point I'm trying to make though if you take a log of a number that should be zero that thing becomes infinite as the number goes to zero the log of it goes to infinity right I guess negative infinity pardon me the opposite direction right the log of a number between zero and one is a negative number so as that probability goes to zero that log goes to negative infinity and guess what negative infinity isn't good for an optimization routine using a likelihood because now you have a likelihood of a negative infinity somewhere floating around that you've got to deal with, right? Or you've got to figure out derivatives of this with respect to this parameter with negative anyway. It's, it's a mess. So one of the ways we can sort of shortcut this is this process. We're going to go predict that, pro that log probability as a function of the attributes. That's what this log linear model is. Here's one prediction, general prediction function, right? If you look at this, mentioned before, we, if in this example, we have 16 probabilities that have to sum to one. So we really only have 15 parameters that we could build. So we think about this. We have four main effects, right? We have, what is it? Uh, one, two, six two-way interactions, three three-way interactions, and one four-way interaction. That sums to is 15 parameters we can estimate. We can't estimate the 16th because it has to sum to one, that last parameter. So we're just gonna sacrifice and not estimate the intercept. It's a little weird. This whole thing is weird. We're down a rabbit hole here, right? So we can estimate this. And basically what we end up getting here is we're by estimating it this way, we basically set the, the predicted value of mu one to zero. But remember that's on the log scale, that's okay. That's the, the con that's the constraint that we just fixed. It turns out that means in what I'm showing you on the screen here, we're actually fighting with M plus a bit because M plus wants to fit and estimate mu 16 to zero and we want mu one to be zero. But we can fix that. We can come up, we can show M plus who's boss. Boss, there's that word again. Everybody says, I'm the boss. Yeah, I'm the boss. No, not of M plus, that's for sure. Uh, and so for instance, if we have only attribute for that class, class two, only attribute four has a one. So that is the estimate for class two's parameter right there. And for a class where we have um, like class six, where attribute two and attribute four are both one, then our prediction function for that class mean is the main effect of attribute one Right here, the main effect of attribute four and the two-way interaction between attribute one and four. Now that two-way interaction is a little weird, but it just tells us whether it's there. But what this allows us to do 
though, is we've basically t converted our 16 probabilities, or 15 probabilities that we can estimate, into 15 parameters. And if those parameters are statistically equal to zero, we can eliminate the parameter. We can reduce the complexity. So this is one way that you can make M plus cooperate more by shutting off some of the parameters it needs to go and estimate the structural model. It's not always most helpful. Uh, let's see here. So the log linear model with all main effects and interactions, though, is statistically equivalent to the saturated structural model. So when I look at like this model here that I'm working my way through, this model with all the parameters in, with 15 parameters, will fit equally well with the structural model where none of the, where we don't do this. We just estimate all the probabilities. They're, they're equivalent, okay? But again, being a categorical data exercise, we can reduce the complexity of it if we knew a little bit about categorical data models. By the way, this is the last class. It has all the parameters in it, right? So that's that's it. Um, Two-way interactions in the higher order or the structural model here are actually similar to the bivariate correlations in categorical models. Uh, models without an interaction imply in uncorrelated attributes. So basically, if we go and estimate this, and we find that the two-way interaction between attributes two and three parameter is zero, that's like testing the correlation between zero between those two, right? So if we had a model without main effects or interactions, we assume all attributes are equally likely. And the higher order effects can actually be removed if they're not different from zero statistically. Here's an example from a paper that I wrote with somebody named Hoffman. I don't know if you know her. She's all right. Last week I made a big deal about Lisa always being compared to Lisa. I played her the video afterwards. Then she had to play me a video and then Hugh had to play one of his videos because see he has his little videos of him gaming that are private on my YouTube channel. <laughs> but she approved of what I said. She thought it was funny, at least, I think. Maybe let her, maybe talk to her about it. But she's all right, she's all right. I don't need to go down that way again, do I? Um, all right, we've estimated a model. There were three attributes for eight, eight different latent classes. Um, now, I told you before, we can't get the intercept. Turns out that intercept, this value is the sum of all the others. It's actually where we could get it if we wanted to, just for competency sake or for completeness sake but take a look these were from at M plus this last parameter right here this is the three-way interaction it has a p-value of 0.703 so if we really wanted to we could remove the three-way interaction we can go from seven estimated parameters down to six if we wanted to take that out and we should see a very small difference between the overall probabilities and actually that's what I did here I estimated the model again have that but let's take a look at what happens right the original model had this vector of probabilities right here when I s when I removed that three-way interaction from it these this doesn't differ that much it differs by rounding in the third place third decimal place here for, for row three right these are the probability for each of the eight profiles but I'm going to try to establish here for you is that the log linear model when applied to just data that you have is like an exploration of dependency and categorical data. So we could use that to go basically say, yeah, we don't we, 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 we estimated eight probabilities, but we could find a way to get away with seven. Or I guess we estimated seven probabilities, some to, some to one to make eight. But we could figure out how to get down to six and not have it change our results meaningfully. That makes sense? Now I don't see many people doing log linear models for this because they're, it's incredibly hard to do already. But I thought I should tell you that. Should we get into tetrachoric models? You all know tetrachorics now. Uh, you can find them in GDNA, CDM, and Flexmert. Um, what they try to do is estimate the tetrachoric correlation between attributes itself. So if you were to build this is the reverse of what I did on my screen. Sorry, I'm going back here. 
what I'm going to say is these models are going to estimate the correlation of this contingency table. How do you go from that, or better yet, in this case, there'll be six of these contingency tables. There's six correlations with four attributes. How do you go from that, though, and get these probabilities? How would you do that? Let me ask that question. This is testing your knowledge of the tetrachoric, right? If I said the correlation right here is 0.7, could you, and, and not only to 0.7, if I could also give you like the marginal frequency of this table, could you then come up with what the before probability should give you? What do you think? Should we get back to the basics of tetrachoric real quick? Sorry, this is why I'm, the DCM world are, are fun because I swear you have to take everything you learned about every modeling area and mush, mush it together to figure out what things work like. That's it. That's it. That's right. That's right. If we wanted to come up with this, what we're drawing, if we had, remember we had uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, and these were the underlying variables. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, these underlying variables right here, we also were given the, the thresholds for each, right? So we, we, and then with the tetrachoric correlation, if I draw my probability contours, you have that. Right. So when you talk about the inverse CDF, in this case, I don't even think you need the inverse. You just need the CDF, and you have to integrate that multivariate normal within those regions of integration. Right here, this is the cell 0, 0. Actually, this is 1, 1, excuse me. This is the cell 0, 0, and there's four cells, right? So the integral, the area under the curve here, will map onto the cell right there. That's bivariate normal. That's for 1. There is a general form of it. What if we, when we talk about having four attributes here, how do we get those probabilities? That's no longer a bivariate normal. It's going to be a four-dimensional multivariate normal, right? So should we, should we start to notate that a little bit? Do you want to? Okay. Here we go, all right? Let's imagine we call um, f of alpha, we'll call this, um, I'm just going to call this MVN, the NVN density, right? Right there, of alpha right there. Actually, this of alpha, but the MVN density depends on a mean vector. In the tetrachoric, what was the mean vector? zero vector, that's correct, right? And then you end up getting a correlation matrix. And I'm going to put an R there for the correlation. R, in this case, is not to be confused with the R matrix in a mixed model. Like we, if you take Lisa's uh, multi-level classes and she talks about the V matrix or the R matrix. No, this is, I, I put R in the place of sigma here just to that represent the diagonals are one. It's correlation, right? So that's that's the function, right? If we provide it some continuous set of four alphas of a zero mean vector and some correlation matrix, it gives us the height of the four dimensions, right? Now, if we want the probability from it, though, we need to integrate. And so that's where we're going to do this. We're going to take our n, vn function of alpha. It's a vector of alphas now, the zero vector our correlations, and if we have four alphas, we need four integrals. These should be partial derivatives. All right. And the limits of integration for it are going to correspond to the, the part of the area you're at based on the zero or one in each part of our attribute profile. Right. So if you remember, here, this is the cut point for the you know, kappa 2. Anyone below this has alpha 2 equals 0. 
and anybody above it has alphas 2 equal 1, right? So this is involved in a cut point, right? When we're integrating this region over here, we're integrating up to kappa 2, right? When we're integrating this region up here, we're integrating from kappa 2 up to positive infinity. So the limits of this integration are either going to be negative infinity, the cut point, or positive infinity, depending on whether or not your attribute profile has zeros or ones right there. Yeah. Is there the improper? No, this is completely proper. This is. Absolutely. It integrates because this distribution is a proper probability distribution. We're just looking at regions underneath the curve for it. Right? So if you want, for instance, if I have attribute profile 0, 0, 0, 0, Right? The limits of integration are all going to be negative infinity. Oh my god, <laughs> can I draw? You know, my, my son's in third grade and they're teaching him handwriting, and he's fine with that. He's really messy like I am. And then they're teaching him typing. He's like, I really hate typing. I hate typing. I'm like, dude, like, once you get used to typing, you won't even know the keyboard anymore. I don't even know which button's where. And I don't even write anything anymore. It's just like faster. Anyway. I'm sure there are. I don't have them. That'd be really cool. <laughs> um, but anyway, for zero, 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 I'm integrating from negative infinity up to the cut point for each one. If I have, if I change this to zero, 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 one, you'll see what happens. The fourth one, the fourth integral here. Oh, the order. I may have the order off. Eh, forget it. Whatever. This one is the integral for alpha 4 uh, right here. goes from kappa 4 up to infinity. Okay? You got to get the order of the integrals right. I'm sorry. I didn't anticipate that. But that's always, they're like an onion, right? You go outside in, and I mix those up. So my apologies. But what I'm trying to give you here is you can still get this vector of probabilities and still compute the full model likelihood, even though in the tetrachoric model, all you're estimating are the correlations between the attributes. Let's do a little bit more math, I know. Who wants to do math the week before Thanksgiving? Thank you. One of you does, and I'm here for it. Uh, we like to tell our child math is money, right? That's why you're all in this program. Do some math, get some money. Type of stuff, right? Um, the uh, what I want you to do now is think about how many correlations do we have between the attributes? So how many parameters does a tetrachoric model have? The lower triangle, whatever that is. <laughs> what is it? N times n minus 1 over 2. That's it? There's six. Six correlations, right? And with each dimension, we'll have four cut points. Because unlike in the real data that you built your tetrachoric for, we actually didn't observe any of these variables. These are all latent variable correlations, right? So that's 10 parameters we have with the tetrachoric model. How many parameters should we have with the saturated log linear model? When I say saturated, it means probability for each. Each probability is estimated. 15. So right now you can tell this is what we call limited information because the, the tetrachoric version of this, which I haven't even gotten that far in my slides, but this this tetrachoric idea for it, how we form those probabilities, is only based on 10 parameters, not all the other higher order moments. It's only the first and second order moments of the data that are working on it. Right? That makes sense? Sort of? I'm sure I'm missing something. There's our tetrachoric again. These were slides that had the tetrachoric. There's our multivariate normal density right there. Here's our limits of integration. Does that seem OK? In this case, this thing is capital C, I believe. A Kyung, I think. We had C in our conversation yesterday. <laughs> I think this is the capital, right? <laughs> anyway, maybe, maybe it's not. Um, these are our continuous underlying variables. There's our density. It's the proper density. It's the multivariate normal. That's it. The mean vector is 0. That's why you don't see the mean vector here. OK, how's your level of okayness with this, overwhelmness with this? 
Because if this class hasn't taught you anything, it should be that where one sees underlying variables or a correlation matrix, there's a segment of our population who want to factor analyze that thing. And that's where we're going next. Right? Because we have alpha tildes, we pretend ones, and they could be continuous variables that we want to put a factor model on. Right? This is doing just that. This higher order structure model says there are three higher order attributes, dependence, disruption, loss of control. These are defined by the 10 attributes in this analysis itself. By the way, 10 attributes, 1,024 classes. Back in 2003, when I started analyzing data, that was pretty tough, I gotta tell you. That was a lot of classes, right? Um, so yeah, dependence, disruption, loss of control. Our studio didn't exist in 2003, by the way. Just telling you how de life has changed. Um, what this is defining, though, here, we can even show it. If this is our model, right? Do you remember what the, uh, if our covariance matrix was this thing right here? That's our covariance matrix, okay? Let's see, all right? It's a correlation matrix. We can define a model for it, right? What does a factor model say the covariance matrix should be? What's our factor model implied covariance matrix? Does anybody remember? Just theta. Nope. No. That. Remember that equation? That is equivalent to saying alpha tilde one equals mu plus you know, one plus lambda one factor one plus error. If we put a factor model on each of our alpha tildes, we end up with this structure right here. Remember that? So literally like I just went with DCMs and I told you about latent class models, factor analysis, mixture models, um, tetrachoric correlations, log linear models, and now higher order factors, all right? I told you DCMs are a wild ride. You can learn a lot about psychometrics, a lot of different topics just by doing one class of models. They're crazy. But yeah, we can put a structural model on that. In the case of this structural model here, I have three latent variables, right? So this phi matrix of factor covariances is three by three, right? These are each of the the observed, like the data, even though they're not observed, they're latent variables. These are each of the attributes. You see I have a bisecting line I'm talking about marginally what proportion of people is with each class. Um, and in that case, each of these arrows represents elements of this lambda vector right here. And then the residual terms are the in here, the residual variances and so forth, unique variances. So when you see a higher order model in a DCM, it's a limited information model. Although, and this is on YouTube, if anybody wants to get involved in some research, I can see a non-limited information higher order model with it, with a log linear, and that would be a lot of fun for a research study sometime. But every time I mention these things on YouTube, I feel like someone else beats me to it. So now you got a head start. Thankfully, nobody watches my channel. I'm okay with that too, except for my son in an angry match. Um, so those are a couple different versions of structural models. The other thing you can do with this, if you really thought hard enough about it is, if you have some something that you want to predict whether somebody's a master of this. Like for instance, if we had, um, in this, in this study, we collected gamblers from a casino boat, right? But if we could look at, for instance, a personal characteristic, let's say, what, what's your favorite game to play in a casino, right? Some people say crap, some people say, you know, slots, some people say whatever, right? But that, we could, we may want to go and see if there's a difference in whether or not a person's more likely to have met a certain DSM criteria with that, 
That's where we put it in a simultaneous structural model. It's basically structural equation modeling where one of the measurement models of DCM we could do as well too. You can figure out a way to do that. That, by the way, that, in, that model we just talked about does, could fit here into this SEM approach, but I don't like the limited information. We could actually go back here with the log linear model and that's where we'd put a covariate, our covariance in to go and predict whether or not somebody, um, some covariate changes the probability that uh, somebody is classified somewhere as well. So, what do you think? Question? I'm missing something here. <clears throat> I'm missing a lot. Because here, for example, what you have there, the outcome is that mu c, so that's that's the attribute that we can have. However, how can we go from here to the probability of answering something correctly? Ah, there's nothing here for that. We need the measurement model for that. Okay. That's right. When we have observed data, when you talk about the, the connection between a latent variable and observed data, that's always a measurement type model. Almost always. There are some structural models that become measurement models in different ways as well, too. Yes. Yeah, that's weird. Here, let's talk about this way. All right? If we have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, right? Each of those has a set of items, y1, y2, and so forth, right? Yes. All right, so this part right here describes that. Now, if you wanted to predict alpha 1, with let's say which game someone plays, it may look like that, right? But that's, now this is data, but it's predicting the latent variable. So the latent variable is the left-hand side of the equation there, right? So that's where the structural model indicator comes from, idea comes from. What about this? What if alpha three, what if you're saying, oh, this attribute, let's make sure these are educational attributes. And this one's really important for a student, like, graduation or something like that. We could do that too. But notice, this direction is a little bit different than that direction. Now, now technically, a model with an arrow like that and a model with an arrow the opposite direction are technically equivalent. This is where that definition of measurement versus structural starts to break down because it turns out if we do this simultaneously, this is no different than the measurement model for alpha three. This prediction thing now becomes another indicator of alpha three. That's the weird flip about structural models, is that you can quickly get a structural model where the thing that you're predicting with your latent variable informs the latent variable now, too. It's the look interface. Yeah. Is that identified, though? Oh, yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah. This is identified. Absolutely identified. Why? Because the y's for this item, right, if, we, if we were to translate this into model, right, each one, each, each of this component where the arrow terminates is now our dependent variable, right? So y, let's call this 10, 11, and 12, right? Is equal to lambda 0 plus lambda 1 alpha 3, right? And you do this 10, 11, 12, you can do that for all the y's. It turns out this part is saying that s is equal to some beta 0 plus beta 1 alpha 3. And you'll note, this is the same, almost the same equation, the different parameters. This becomes another indicator of that latent variable. So when Lisa teaches SEM, she doesn't have to have time for it, the structural model part. We really would like an advanced SEM part because this is part of the conversation we'd have in that class, right? This part right here is saying alpha one equals some you know, beta zero plus beta one times G, right? That has the latent variable on the left side and the observed variable on the right. This has latent variable on the right side, observed variables on the left. And technically there, you can flip the signs, or you can flip the direction of it and it's equivalent model also. So what's latent versus observed, it becomes, or what's a measurement versus structural, starts to break down at some point. But I hope that helps answer your question. We're talking about measurement, your question is about a measurement model phenomenon that I just went down a tangent, sorry about that. Another question. To me, what is weird about this is that, for example, last, last week with DCMs, we saw, well, in some sense, 
we covered this content to me because we also had these attributes and we also had these different latent classes uh, which, which were considered attributes, mm -hmm. the, the 16 things, for example. Right. But now he, well, now we are mainly focused on that thing, but I cannot see what the difference between these two things are. Yeah, what it's. So last week we had the 16 attributes, right? The 16 different classes. If we're talking about predicting one of the attributes, right? The difference is like the idea of 16 classes. 16 classes is what our four attributes form, the different permutations that we have. But we want to predict only that one right there, right? So what we're trying to do for prediction, what I'm talking about here, if we're trying to predict the status of one person's attribute, really would only apply to this vector, right? And so that's where it becomes a little weird. The joint distribution of the attributes is this multivariate Bernoulli, but we rarely predict the joint distribution. We tend to only predict marginal quantities from it. And that's where this is starting to, I'm going, this is super advanced stuff compared to what we've taught you in our program so far. Yeah. Yes, final comment. So can we say that the, the main difference here is like the focus? Because for DCMs, the focus is like a specific item and how the attributes contribute to, to model that specific item. But here we are trying to model the attribute instead of the attribute. Yeah, that's the difference in structural versus measurement. Yes. Okay. Yes. The measurement model is how the attributes relate to the item response. The structural model is how other things predict the attributes or how the attributes are interrelated. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I was, so with the DCM, an attribute, like if there's three classes and you have like a row and then you have the probability that someone falls into, um, each one of those classes, are we predicting each individual class within an attribute, or are we instead of doing the whole thing all at once? All at once. But, and so if you have three classes, that's not really a DCM because you have yeah, the yeah. even numbers. But three attributes yeah. would be eight classes. Yes. Yep. And, and so instead of trying to do a, like one row, we're doing, uh, okay. Because, okay. so it's the difference between and this is difficult because all of the, the, the graphical models that you see mm -hmm. are between are all pairwise associations. So it's really difficult to depict what's happening apart from equations for yeah. us, right? What do I mean by that? Right? You've you've probably seen this before. Um, X predicts Y might predict M predict Y. You've seen that before? Mediation. Love mediation. Who doesn't love some good mediation? The smell of mediation in the morning. It's just like coffee, right? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> There's some people who really love mediation. Actually, it's a really, it is a really, like the, the research into it, it's cool. I'm not, I'm not going to pick on mediation or the people who do it. It's actually really useful. But when I say that, these three variables also represent a joint distribution, right? And if these three variables are discrete, if they're, let's, let's say they're all binary, right? Then there's only eight permutations of how people can have three variables, right? But this model is only modeling at any one given time two pairwise relationships. So the model itself, you have to specify it either on the marginal distribution or conditional distribution. It's forming, this is, a, this is the condition. This, is, this, this circle right here is the distribution of m given x. This circle right here is y given x, right? There's nothing that says you can't go and model the distribution of y and m given x, but that's a different proposition. What do I mean by that, right? This is the difference between a multivariate distribution and a univariate distribution. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting text messages. So this is, um, like if you want to really get into where this would be, you got to learn a little bit more about multivariate distributions. Maybe you've seen multivariate um, regression, multivariate ANOVA. You took the multivariate class here. Do you cover that multivariate? You know you get into multivariate ANOVA. Have you done that? Who's taken the multivariate class? Yeah. You got MANOVA. Do you get multivariate regression in there? Yeah. Maybe. 
Yeah? Cool. It all fits from the same idea, right? But basically, now, here in a joint distribution, we can, <laughs> if these were categorical, so that's a continuous version. And multivariate normal makes it a bit easier because there's some nice, um, there are no higher level moments, right? There's nothing beyond the covariance matrix. But if these were not, if these were discrete data, we might have a two level interaction between them that we have to model. And now we have to model that somehow, right? So just ways to thinking about this. But I hope that answers your question a little bit. Like, yeah. and Nathan, you're sorry, it was Nathan. Like, are we doing one or the other? In this case, in the thing above this here, this is marginaling each, modeling each attribute marginally or univariately, right? Whereas we could come up with a model that does it jointly if we wanted to. We don't need to. So like if you're taking partial derivatives of two things. There's no derivatives involved in this. This is just straight specifying a, a probability model. Okay. It's, it's hard to think about. It. Well, yes. And this is why, though, once you learn it this way, you can't unsee how we structure a curriculum. Like, why are you in linear models first? Why? Because all of this is linear models, right? And if we did a, a different job, if we, if we looked a little bit differently how multivariate works, rather than teaching a MANOVA is this, if we taught, actually, what we're going to teach is uh, modeling variables multivariately in a broader sense, I think you'd get it this way, right? Rather than MANOVA and the multivariate regression, you have to sort of put them together and induce, have like inductive reasoning to figure out the broader sense, right? Or is that deductive? Inductive, I think. You're going up rather than deductive going down, right? So. The point of what I'm trying to say here is there's lots of ways of looking at categorical data and coming up with equivalent models. But the, the bigger philosophy you have to ask is am I modeling something by itself or jointly? So that would be the probability of X and Y happening at the same time in mm -hmm. X? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now you talk about multivariate distributions. MANOVA is the case where X and Y would be, or in this case, Y and M were both continuous. That's, that's multivariate normal land. But what, what if Y and M were both binary? Well, now you're stuck, potentially. You'd have to figure out like um, a multinomial distribution for them, right? And what if one was continuous and one was binary? That's even harder. <laughs> What's that? Uh, it could be a mixture model. Or it could be another trick, right? But basically the idea is that if you understand joint distributions, right, f of x and y, you can also work on its sort of component parts, f of y given x, f of x, right? So you could even do that. There's different ways that you can play around with the distributions themselves to come up with equivalent models. So how's that work? All right. I'm going to take a break now. I'll take some more questions when we're done, though. How's that sound? All right, we can start up again. Any questions on what we covered to this point? Yeah. Yeah. So you're showing here that there's correlation happening between the distractors. Where am I seeing? What part of that is that? In? Right here, yes. Yes. So I guess I expected the deep parameters to circle back into the factor and then the point just be between the factors. Yeah. So this is the correlation between higher order factors. And the D is technically like a, uh, the, the method I used to plot this was something, uh, an old version of plotting it. Error usually gets, how people plot graphical models, there's a whole weirdness to it. So. These are all tetrachoric correlations, so the variances were fixed to one is basically what that was. So, so technically, the error should be going from the factors. Oh, no, I mean, so basically the idea is this. Um, uh, the, these error, these, these are latent variables. So the model predicts each of these other latent variables, but let's just imagine to make to make the structural model make sense, the observed data, if you're used to this being a three-factor factor model, these would be observed items, right? 
that means in these latent variables, I actually set the variance to one for each. So there's no residual to it. These are just, it's like a measurement model of it itself. So that's where that, that comes from. The D is like a disturbance, but yeah, that's what that, yeah. It's, so I will note, these are all latent variables predicting other latent variables here. And actually after Thanksgiving, we're gonna get into higher order models a little bit as well. <clears throat> the purpose of that is um, trying to address the disconnect between providing multidimensional scores or unidimensional scores. I think you can do both, but it's going to take a higher order, model, a different modeling approach to do. So, potentially, you could do both. No, it's okay. Other questions? Okay. No questions. Am I hearing that right? We're all good? Sorry, I said okay quickly. Should I just pause and take a drink? Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about how we estimate these models. So, true story. <laughs> I know the date because Barack Obama was being inaugurated. That's how long ago this was, right? It's like uh, uh, January 20th, 2000 Nine. Uh, we have almost a complete book, like that Rub Templin Henson, Andre and I and Bob. We had a phone call the night before and I was like, guys, the book's fine, but we don't ever tell how, how people how to do it, how to estimate it. So what we came up with was, I was gonna write a chapter about how to estimate this in M plus. So I did in like a day and a half, two days, something like that. <laughs> chapter nine became that. So you can check out chapter nine if you, I didn't get, put it up there. But basically, this is how it works. I have a bunch of in information. Um, oops, this one. Why am I opening up multiple windows? There we go. Okay. I have this uh, handout. This is a handout from, actually, it's this year, but it's, it's from before. Um, let's imagine in the book you'll find this example data set. I had seven items, three attributes, and 10,000 people. This is simulated data, just to make a point. Um, why seven attributes, or sorry, seven items, is that if you look at the Q matrix, I have three attributes, attribute one, attribute two, attribute three. This, at, this Q matrix is what I would call balanced. By balanced, I mean each item, each attribute is measured by the same number of items. There's four for each. And if we were to take Q transpose Q, remember what Q transpose Q was? Did I tell you that? I told you that in the beginning of the semester. It gives you the count of times an item is measured down the diagonal and the count of times a pair of items is measured in the off diagonal when they're measured together. So here, for instance, um, attribute one and two both measure item four and item seven. Attributes one and three measure items six and seven, right? So that Q transpose Q of this Q matrix is a diagonal matrix, uh, not a is a is a square and symmetric matrix that is, um, so far, it is symmetric, and it's uh, all these always symmetric. But the off-diagonal elements are all equal, right? Each pair of items, or each attribute measures together um, two items, and each attribute is measured by four items. So that's the Q matrix, just a generic version of it. But to build this in M plus, we have to basically take M plus, which is built to give you a non-confirmatory mixture model, and put a massive number of constraints. <laughs> Sergio, would you pick a better term to describe than massive? No, that's accurate. I believe my, my, my partner would call it a shit ton. I think those are her words of constraints. And when, when I first learned M plus to do this, um, one of the things that we were really worried about is that DCMs, people were publishing, had a hard time publishing about them, but they were also very peripheral to what we do in psychometrics because they didn't look the same. And so we made the decision for the book to do M plus because we thought if M plus does all the other psychometrics, we can be, look, we're like the other one. See, we're just a subset of it. So we picked M plus for it. M plus is still pretty good for it. It's just very slow. But basically, here's what we have to do. We have to go and build our specs of latent class models. We have to then map them onto each item. We have to label things. We have to define the structural model. <laughs> we got to do M plus in text. The, the fast forward of all this is that I got a few R files. I think Sergio, you used them in Georgia even. So for my birthday one year, Professor Hoffman made me a SAS macro to do all of this. 
kid you not, that's where it started. So she built it in SAS, and then later on, Andre Rupp uh, and Oliver Wilhelm, Wilhelm when, he was in, when Andre was in uh, Berlin, I think, converted it to R. And then I took it from R and I added some stuff to it. So you can find out how to do that on my website. And that's what you used, right, for some of the stuff you had before. So, so what people will do now is grab those R files, create a bunch of M plus syntax, and then go back to the syntax and modify it for what they do. But because we're learning M plus in this class, I thought this would be a good exercise. I might regret that belief, right? So I'm going to teach you M plus first. M plus will only estimate this with marginal maximum likelihood, right? It uses EM algorithm, which is equivalent to MML, but it will switch between quasi-Newton and Fisher scoring just like it does for all the other marginal maximum likelihood that you see, right? The setup is very much like you saw M plus for your homework last time as well. So let's talk through this. First thing we need is a latent class to attribute profile table. You always see in my slides a series, actually if I go back to my slides, I shouldn't have closed them. So this right here is exactly what I'm talking about. This is our class number, one through 16. Over there is our attribute profile. Turns out, this also goes by a different name. And one day my advisor, Jeff Douglas at Illinois, was in his office and he said, oh yeah, that's a decimal to binary number conversion. You can just change the base of the number and be fine. You ever heard of that before? So this page in my notes does just that. But let me describe it logically for a moment here. This number is a decimal number. Decimal meaning it's base 10, which means it repeats every 10 numbers, right? 0 through 9, then we had a, num a 1 in front, and it goes 0 through 9, and we had a 2 in front, zero, and so forth, right? Base 10, fairly okay. Each of the attributes is base 2, a 0 and a 1. So it turns out you can convert for every decimal number, there is a string of binary digits that you can represent it with. It is called a decimal to binary number conversion. And if you work in DCMs, you need to be very familiar with this because this decimal to binary number conversion has a lot of good places to work in DCMs. Second, another place where this could happen, how many of you do simulation studies? How many of you do simulation studies with four conditions? Four binary conditions. Well, if you're thinking about how you do a simulation study and you're coding it in data, in, in your R, every time you have like a different condition, you may have to add another layer to a loop. Like, for condition one is zero to one. For condition two is zero to one. Condition three is zero to one, right? Turns out here, no, you could just have one loop over 16 different permutations. With that number, create the conditions for each loop and just have one loop simplify your code to do what you do in simulation studies. So when I teach simulation studies, I teach this method as well, where you have factorial factors in your simulation, you can convert a decimal to a binary and just use one loop in code. Works a lot different, a lot better. Now, here, decimal to binary. Let's talk about it real quick. And you know, I'm out of my league here. If you just Google decimal to binary, uh, look, it just it just converted that to binary. If you think of each of my characters as having a base number system as well, too, it's just represented with digits. Math gets everywhere. We could do this as well. But decimal to binary, the way it works is this. Let me see if I can. I want to give, I want the description here. <laughs> so it turns out, if we know what the decimal number is, we can divide it by the binary number, two, and whatever the remainder of it is, is the pattern of each of the attributes that we have. Right? So here, 156 uh, could be our decimal number. Uh, we divide it by 2, there's no remi remainder. 78 divided by 2, no remainder. 39 divided by 2, remainder is 1. Right? So we then do 38 or uh, 19 divided by 2. That's um, 19 is what's left over. Uh, sorry, the smaller number. Still remainder 1, so forth, right? But 156 could be represented with this remainder pattern right there. That's what that looks like, right? Now you can go in reverse as well too. You want to see the reverse? 
series of exponents, but you can see it. Oh, it doesn't? Is it 155? No, it looks like it gave what the actual division. It looks like it gave 70. Hmm. Well, I'll have to look into that. But basically, that's basically. Sorry. Good point. I needn't prepare this. This is off the top. I should have prepared some slides for it. But basically, the idea is this if you have a series of binary digits, you see how many that you have. There's actually eight numbers here, but we actually decimal start. It's a zero index thing. So here, if there's a, it's one times two to the seven plus zero times two to the six, and so forth. And that's how you get your um, decimal number from every binary. So is that what you were saying with the other number? Yeah, because the other one, I think the first one was in the fifth or sixth place instead of the seventh. Yeah, that would be bad. Okay. Anyway, point is, you can switch between the two always. And if you go look through my R files, you'll find a function called deck to bin and bin to deck. One goes one way, one goes the other. But that's what this is right here. We need to go and specify a from each class to each profile of attributes. And this, this is a graphical depiction of that mathematical process. I built this slide for people who didn't want to deal with math. You're all math people here. So even if you don't think you're a math person here, you're a math person, right? Who doesn't talk, who doesn't love a good base number transformation? Am I right? Ever heard of hexadecimal numbers, by the way? Things like that? It's a base, it's a, it's a what's the base of hexadecimal? Is it 12? No, what's? 16, right? Yeah. So point I'm trying to make is you have these numbers can be stored in different, with different base systems. But it's equivalent across. That's a level of math that I'm not super good at explaining. Right. You with me? All right. So here, each class has a profile of attributes. There it is right there. Next, using the Q matrix, we need to know for each class what the kernel, what I call the kernel is. What are the parameters that go with each class, right? So here we have, we know we have eight classes. Here are all the profiles for each of the classes. For item one, only attribute one is measured. So for the classes where attribute one is zero, we just have lambda one, or the, the intercept. And for the classes where lambda one is one, we have the intercept plus the main effect of attribute one. Okay, this is just another table denoting which parameters we need where. Turns out, for every single cell in this table that has a set of parameters, so the core of this table, we're gonna have to do something in M plus to specify that every single one that is eight times seven for this table it's a lot that's where the tediousness happens that's why i use the code right you didn't tell me about the code until my very last month matt madison didn't that's what i do too i don't tell people about the code i want them to understand the core of it first and then you can let something automate it right so think about what we're trying to do right to m plus when we say we want eight classes it wants to put for every item in every class a probability in there, right? Now these are not probabilities, these are logits, but we want to make sure that those probabilities become equal based on our tables. That's what we have to do. So the way we do that in plus is we create a label for each. So if you go back to this previous table, the cells that have the same entries will all get a label. So for any item, like let's take item one, the very first entry I see is the intercept. I'm gonna call that T1 underscore one. The T actually stands for a threshold because M plus is gonna estimate a threshold for this class and that item, right? So if I call that T1 underscore one, every time I see it, that same parameter, I am going to call T1 underscore one. I'm gonna need M plus to keep that label. So the first four entries of item one are T1 underscore one. Right. If you look at the, when we get to the next set of parameters, even though there's two parameters there, M plus is still just gonna estimate one threshold. So I'm gonna call that T1 underscore two, the second threshold for the first item, All right? And you'll see this for item two, T2 underscore one showed up first. 
Turns out there's four of the or four of those. One, two, three, and four. Right? And then T's two underscore two. Right? The number of thresholds that you have per item is two to the number of Q matrix measured attributes for that item. Right? So here, for item one, the Q matrix just has one attribute there. So there'd be two thresholds. For item four, there's two attributes, so there'd be four thresholds. Right? And for item seven, there's three attributes, so there'll be eight thresholds. Right? And you can look at it. Item seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means each one of those probabilities is going to get estimated separately. So what this label will do in M plus is basically say M plus, where you would separately estimate a parameter, don't do that. Make the parameters constrained to be equal. Okay, these are constraints, the constrained version of the, mi the mixture model. How are we doing so far? Okay, you could also do the structural model. Uh, oh, I have the Word document online. I should probably just use the Word document. I'm telling you, like, I don't know what happened to like my, my, my office stuff this week, but it's just crapping the bed left and right. Pardon my language. Just, you ever have weeks like that where it's like, yeah, I'm not going to have symbols for it, but here. This is better. Right here. So there's our log linear model. Now, to specify M plus syntax, here's what you do, right? There's, there's all the sections. There's the title, the data, the variable. Here, keeping in variable, number of classes is eight, right, in this case. Right? You have to tell it that. Type of mixture model starts at zero. I keep starts at zero. So remember in mixture models, we had the start, what did the starts function do in M plus? Remember that? Random starts. For the diagnostic model, you're going to find this thing takes forever to estimate. So doing random starts is usually not a, a luxury in M plus. You had your master's thesis estimated in M plus. I know it was a little bit more complicated than this. How long was one analysis for your master's? That's way quick. <laughs> this so I turn off the starts. So why? What? That's dangerous. But I want to say a couple things about that. When we define a diagnostic classification model, we put a series of constraints on the likelihood surface. There's there's the monotonicity constraints number one, and then there's the equal the equivalent class probability constraints. This table right here. There's one more constraint we do. This threshold has to be bigger than that threshold, right? The, the probability are actually, in this case, they're reversed. So this is actually less than that threshold, but that's because threshold is the probability of a zero, not a one. But point being, there's an order constraint between the first threshold and the second threshold. By putting those constraints in, we've reduced the likelihood surface into a very small, a much smaller region. That surface could still have multiple modes, yes. However, I found them very hard to find. Like they're very much in extreme places. And so I've found this to be somewhat effective. Now that doesn't mean it's entirely effective and there's no proof out there mathematically to say we're fine. We're sort of living on the edge here. You technically should have more starts, but good luck with that in M plus. Um, I used to have students try to find multiple modes. And I wanna say one case I found one, but that's it. And that's, I've run M plus a lot. All right, so that's the M plus startup. The model is where things get all crazy. For the structural model, we define that in the overall section. Remember the overall section of M plus syntax. It's what you want to be constrained to equal across all the classes. It's also where we put our, have access to the structural model parameters for M plus. All right, so each of these is one of our log linear structural model parameters. Um, then for each class, we label each threshold for every item. So every item and every class shows up there, but what we do afterwards is we give it a parenthesis and we tell it that's threshold one. So what M plus will do across classes, right? this table that we have right here 
For the first class, we enter those thresholds. For the second class, we enter these thresholds. But you'll note threshold one appears in class one and class two. So that's the cross class constraint that M plus is linking in. All right, with me? Cool. So we're almost there. Once we get done with all eight classes, now what's left, bless you, is to define the order constraints and the log linear model parameters. So M plus is estimating thresholds, but those aren't intercepts, main effects, interactions that the DCM gives us. So instead, forget the top part of the structural model, I'll leave that off for now. Down here, for item one, and I really wish I would have capitalized this. This is an L, L1 underscore zero. That is lambda one underscore zero or the intercept for item one. L1 underscore one one is the main effect of attribute one on item one. So we know going back to that table we created before, our first threshold corresponds to our model where lambda, zero, lambda one underscore zero exists. But I have to change the sign of it from negative to positive because our lambdas are defined on modeling the probability of y being one, whereas the threshold is the probability of y being zero. So we just put a negative sign out in front of it and we convert the sign. Okay, I'm telling you, jogs every little detail you might have skipped over in a class, you've got to know to be able to do DCMs, I'm telling you. They're all here, log linear models, thresholds, conversions, all that stuff. I throw in base number of conversions and calculus and sums today, right? I'm telling you, this is a degree, of, this is pretty fun stuff. If you would like learning, start studying this stuff. It's pretty fun. And then remember what I told you about the, what theta means last week, which we're not talking about anymore, so never mind. Anyway. Then we get this next item, this next threshold, that's the sum of both. And then finally, we can say we need the main effect to be positive. There's our monotonicity constraint. So now we can do this with every type of item. Three, four, these are two-way interactions. Let's see all of our constraints. And we can get them to the uh, three-way interaction item right here. Look at all those constraints. That's a nightmare. But you can build it all. Okay. Now, told you that to tell you this. Who wants to see those functions I told you about in R? Here you go. Um, there's a package called M plus automation that you could use, you've probably seen. Uh, actually, I already told you about that. I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm out of it. But now, given a Q matrix right here and a bunch of data, I can create an M plus file and from that M plus will run. Let me, uh, there it goes. This is how fast it's running. This is a four attribute example and where did my files go here? Here is what it looks like. Um, this is the M plus input it creates. It created all this right here. Pretty nice, right? How do you like that? Better? Yeah, the by hand, I mean like, here, let's just, this is, the ma this is the size of the input file. Tell me when to stop. Okay, there you have it. I'd like to thank Lisa Hoffman. I think it was literally 2009 when I got this birthday present from her, right? That was a nice birthday present, right? You should thank a, thank a Hoffman when you get a chance. But, um, so it's gonna take a while. <clears throat> But when you get the output, if you get the output, I'm not lying. <laughs> Let's see, I don't know this is today. Mm, we're getting close. You see what's happening, by the way, with this? You can see it moving a little slower. 
this is using an EM algorithm to estimate things. The chapter I gave you for latent class models, the Bartholomew, Knott, and Mazdaki chapter six, it outlines the EM algorithm. Like literally that chapter helped me estimate the DINA model as a consultant for College Board in 2004, like long time ago in grad school. It was nice to have. But then EM slows down a lot. So you see this QN right there? That is where it switches to quasi-Newton. So what you'll end up seeing is it's doing EM, 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 and then it gets to quasi-Newton. Now, one of the interesting things about EM is that it's finding its local optima, right? It's searching the peak. I got a mountain here, it's sort of moving up the mountain. The EM algorithm should never exceed the peak. It should only get to the peak of the mountain. As we get to the end of the estimation of M plus here though, it will start to appear that we've overshot it because the difference in log likelihood will turn positive at some point, or turn negative. Like this, this is the difference between the two log likelihoods right here. And if that turns negative, it's like you went too far and had to come back. That is nothing but an artifact of M plus or estimation. It should stop right there because it's numerically unstable. That's basically it having a hard time figuring out the mixture models. And the biggest part of that problem comes from those logged latent class means. When you have a latent class with very few people in it, they want to become negative infinity. M plus puts a limit to that artificially. But hoping this will finish up here in just a bit. In the process, you know what, I'll just go back to the word file there. It does show some of the output, but basically you've seen this output before, right? You just did this for homework, three parameters. Most of the time you will not get this chi-square test of model fit. Why is that? That's right, too many response patterns. So you can't use it, it becomes irrelevant. We have to use a limited information model fit for it. Then, the first part is the proportion of people in each class, right here. Then comes our model parameter estimates, right? So here you have your estimate of each parameter. You have a standard error of the estimate. You have the estimate divided by the standard error, which is something we call a, anybody want to know the name of that test? Wald test, right? Because the parameter divided by its standard error uh, converges to a, asymptotically to a standard normal distribution. So basically we take this thing and treat it like a z-score and we calculate the area and the two-tailed tests on either side of that. But what this tells us though is, for instance, Look at item seven here. The three-way interaction is quite large, but it also, also has a quite, a quite a big standard error, so its p-value is big. So in theory, we could get rid of the three-way interaction for that item estimated again if we wanted to. Similarly, if you look at the structural model, this third structural model parameter here has a very large p-value as well. We could probably get rid of it estimated. No big deal. This is still running. So you can see what, oh, I know why. It, it finished, and then it's running again. Why is it running again? Oh, come on, did I run it twice on, on accident? Anyway, M plus output though, goes on and on and on and on and on and on. All right, so your bivariate information, bivariate model fits at the bottom. You got a bunch of item parameters elsewhere. There you have it. How are we doing? Okay. That's one type of estimation. I'm not spending a long time on M plus. I have a question. Yes. Um, can you go back to the questions? Which ones? Uh, in, in this? Yeah. Um, so you were saying you could just take out some parameters and run it again. Mm -hmm. So if you took out those parameters, what, like going back to the table of everything that you had? Ah. How would I do it? Yeah. Turns out with that, I wouldn't change anything because taking out the parameters doesn't necessarily change the tables unless I change the Q matrix. However, like for instance, if I wanted to take out L7, one, two, three, which is the three-way interaction, mm -hmm. if I go to this item, you'll note L7, one, two, three just shows up here. All I have to do is just delete this and delete that and then delete any mention of it in the constraints. But it wouldn't change any of your tables? No, it wouldn't actually. 
because, take a look at this. Item seven's last category right here, if I remove lambda seven, three, one, two, three, the three-way interaction from it, this table would just be left with what's highlighted and that doesn't appear in any other cell. Right? This highlight, highlighted part has all three main effects, all three two-way interactions, no other cell changes. So therefore, it wouldn't change it. Now, there are maybe other combinations where it would change. Yeah. But generally speaking, so long as you don't modify the Q matrix, just removing interaction terms is fine. When you remove the main effect, then that's a modification of the Q matrix, and that will change the tables. But since it's a unique cell anyways, yes. it's going to have a unique that's right. It's just so we're, you're setting like this parameter to zero, but the cell needs to be unique also. Yep. Good, good point. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Other questions? No, I wouldn't go there yet. I would look at model fit first, right? And in model fit, you'd need to get down to that limit, you know, basically what was done in the last homework, the limited information model fit, and then plus that comes out here in the tech 10 output. So this is telling us, for instance, this pair of items, item 18 and 21, has a really big chi-square. That probably should, there's something wrong there. But yeah, I would consider q matrix modification when, if I didn't have the good fitting data. <clears throat> questions, any other questions? Right. This is not a Bayesian estimation method. Right. Technically, you could think of the prior distribution or the, the structure model as a prior distribution of attributes, but because we're marginalizing across it, sort of like an empirical prior, and we don't really lump that into Bayes. However, um, we could estimate this in Bayes, but good luck. Let's talk about the options. You heard me, most of you were in my class last fall where we talked about Stan. Stan runs with an algorithm that's called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. The Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uses this um, idea of momentum from Hamiltonian physics, which involves a derivative with respect to each parameter to try to give an efficient guess as to a proposal value for each parameter in the Markov chain. But in the diagnostic model, we have a set of parameters that are discrete. The attributes are discrete parameters. And you cannot, is that undefined too? What's the derivative of a discrete parameter on a non-smooth function? Is it also undefined? All this math people slacking off on their jobs. I think it's undefined. Yeah. Can't do it. So you can't use Stan easily. Now there have been people who've figured out, sorry for the sun ding in your eyes. Uh, figured out exactly how to marginalize in Stan. So basically, does the marginal likelihood. Uh, some of the former students I work with at KU figured out how to do that. But that can only work so well. It's really difficult to code. And honestly, it sort of breaks down in different places as well. That doesn't get you out of the problem that we have in Stan. One of the other problems we have which is we have a whole bunch of monotonicity constraints right here. So the other part that Stan and actually Jags has a problem with is it's impossible or very difficult to define a lower bound of a parameter that depends on a different parameter. You have to go and reorganize the entire space to do that. You need a fixed lower bound, not, a, not one that varies from iteration to iteration. That's a problem too. Stan even talks about where in, in Bayes, a Bayes sense, uh, that if you look at its user manual, it says, well, mixture models really don't get estimated well in Bayesian settings. And part of that's also the, we have to worry about label flipping and so forth. So Stan's out. Jags is out because these can, Jags would actually do this model, but the constraints throw Jags out. So now we're stuck. What do we do? We create our own. Or as Lisa pointed out, I like to say, roll your own, evidently, on the podcast. So we rolled our own. I rolled my own. There's a package out there that I created in those dark days of the pandemic. And I named the package blatant, B-L-A-B, 
and the word latent as in latent variable. If you're a fan of English, I'm not really a fan of English, but I'm just stuck to speaking it because that's all I know. Um, you'll note that that is not how you spell the word blatant in English. Blatant is a word spelled B-L-A-T-A-N-T, uh, totally or offensively conspicuous or obtrusive, unpleasantly loud and noisy. Yeah, that is why I'd use the play on words I did, Bayesian latent variables. That's what that stands for. And now, of course, it won't freaking open. My God, just work. Arr. So mad at the computers when I need a website to open. Anyway, leave it there. So it turns out, you can download this off a of CRAN. Blatant is what it's called. Okay? And, or, actually, what I would recommend, don't download it off a of CRAN. I actually have a, a secret release candidate that's been up for two years that you can get from GitHub. So just get it from GitHub. But here's the example that I want to show you. And this is relevant to your homework, so now, now you'll pay attention. Your homework, I asked you to do this in Blatant. Didn't I? I think I did. Anyway. Here is, using this file, you can actually download version 1.2-RC1, which is release candidate. There's an extra function in there that makes things a little bit easier. But let me describe Blatant for you real quick, because I think it's a lot easier to use for DCMs, of course. Um, and of course, it's still not opening. Oh my gosh. Well, that opened, that's nice. Why am I not seeing blatant? Anyway. The program itself is underdeveloped. I don't talk about it a lot because I wrote it and I don't have time to fix it. If any of you want to get some experience in coding in R though, welcome to my, welcome, come, come play, let's talk blatant. Um, you can be a contributor. But basically the idea is this. Um, blatant works on a series of now, of course, I needed to install that. I shouldn't have done that. Gosh, I'm telling you. How many of you have used Blatant before? Anybody? One of you has. Two of you have. All right. All right. And of course, it failed. Why am I getting a failure here? Oh, of course, G Forger. Give me one second. I got to make another repair. Let's see if it works. Uh, R. I need some auxiliary R files here. Um, tools. Nope, that's not gonna work either. All right, let's do this. I have an, uh, where there's a will, I'm gonna have a way, I promise you. We're gonna figure this out. Dare I go to notebooks? Can I be saved by the notebooks? No. I swear to God. I swear to God. Yes. Yeah, the way that Duo, the login Duo changed, like I use uh, like fences in um, Firefox, but good luck logging into Outlook on that. It'll just open up 50 windows and you can't get it to stop. It's like, seriously? All right. What did you say? Trust. trust. I'm gonna lose my, my stuff today. There. You know what? I'm just forget the LSS. Let's go to R. Okay, it's coming. I promise. go. 
probably can't see that, can you? All right, you ready? Okay, let's try this again. Now let's reload it. None, not installing anything. There it goes. Okay. <laughs> Come on! <sighs> While this installs, see if I can get my composure back. Is what? It's breathe? Breathe. 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 Everybody breathe. <laughs> Do a lot of breathing and then we'll throw something. Yeah. It's almost done. It's compiling some stuff. R C plus plus. So I wrote blatant in a, a generalized linear modeling framework. And it, latent was, I had this thought I was gonna put all the latent variable models in it, and then I quit trying after a while, because it's just, I didn't have the time. You've probably seen me deal with that before. So it's hard, it takes a lot of time to develop really good code that works well, right? And I just don't have it. But now it's installed, I've got it loaded. Here's our data. It's 27 item, four attribute test. And here's the Q matrix right here. Can you all see the screen? Is it large enough or do you need it bigger? It's bigger. bigger. You got it. How's that? Is that better? Can I do that instead of one smaller? So our Q matrix, I just had it. Looks like this. 27 items, 4 attributes, right? Okay. Now, there is a function called Q matrix to blatant syntax, which will write blatant syntax for you. How many of you have used Levon before? So blatant syntax works like Levon syntax. Actually, I made you use Levon in this class. Showed it to you, right? You write, you use a character string and you write your model in a character. Well, the blatant syntax is different than Levon in that it doesn't use Levon's syntax definition. I actually hate the way Levon does syntax because if you remember, if you define a latent variable, it's you know, theta equal tilde, and you have all the items separated by the plus, that makes it look like you're summing all those items up to come up with a latent variable, and the order is backwards. So instead, I used R's syntax for linear models. So basically, you create syntax that looks like this. Here's an item, x1. My attributes are v1 through v4, right? So if I could observe attribute v2, I would just use a linear model predicting x1 with it. That's what this is right here, right? So the Q matrix, if I flip to it, see only measures, V2 is only on right, right there, right? So you can see what this syntax build is for every item, it provides a linear model. And the other part of this is that the linear model in R involves all the linear model specifications in R. So you have a latent variable interaction, you can specify it. V2 colon V5 is the interaction between latent variables right there, right? V2 is the main effect by itself. V5 is the main effect of V5 and so forth. Then you have to tell it the latent variables. Uh, in this case, MV Bernoulli is, estimates them all as latent variables with Bernoulli. They're ordinal. Some of the options here are really stupid, but they were built in anticipation of me working to build more stuff, like I wanted to have continuous latent variables here because there's some great mixtures of continuous and categorical latent variable models. Never got to it. Uh, and then we tell it the distribution of the observed items. Now, they all have to be Bernoulli and they all have to have logit, but I was anticipating letting that be normal or heck, Cauchy or whatever you want to call it, right? Just pick a distribution. That's the syntax. It goes much quicker than M plus. And it estimates using Gibbs sampling. So remember Gibbs sampling? What is the unique part of Gibbs sampling that makes it different than Metropolis Hastings? You need to be able to sample from the posterior. It's not always a conjugate, but most of the time. Directly. There's no rejection in Gibbs sampling, right? So Blatant uses an algorithm by um, a group, a two, two professors called Holmes and Held, 2006 in a logistic distribution. The Holmes and Held algorithm has data augmentation that it works in. Like I could spend a whole like class just describing this algorithm. But long story short, what it boils down to 
is I am predicting um, I'm predicting the outcomes of each of each variable with these latent variables here and then I use a, a basically a constraint matrix to in, enforce my monotonicity constraints behind the scenes it put, it puts the constraints on for me so I don't even see it happening and it's a full set of constraints so if you look at the R package CDM or you look at the R package GDNA CDM doesn't even put constraints on by default, which means now you're getting it mixture models that give you probabilities of 1.2 because of the way they form attributes. That was a bad idea. They finally added the constraints, but they don't turn them on. GDNA puts constraints just on the main effects. That's still not appropriate. <laughs> so full constraints right here. I think both the packages allow full constraints, but you have to find out how to do it. Full sets of constraints right here. Now, you estimate it with just a simple function right here. Uh, this is uh, a little control function. I'm going to only estimate this really quickly. Just going to have 50 observations estimated. Fit, uh, just do 50 times. I wanted to show you how this works. It parallelizes it. It takes a while to estimate. As Aiken can tell you, they, the models take a long time to run. This algorithm with Holmes and Held, if you're into Bayesian algorithms, it's super inefficient compared to the predecessor for it by, uh, for no, normal OJOs by Albert and Chip. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's really cool if you ever want to study Bayesian algorithms. I'm happy to point you some directions. It's pretty neat. Um, but it's, it's, again, estimating it. So what you're getting here, DCMs take a long time to estimate. Am I wrong? M plus, long time. The ones that go quick, CDM or GDNA, do them in ways where they're unstable most of the time by default. So I don't trust a lot that come from that unless you lock down constraints. And I really don't trust um, straight days. But that's our options. But as soon as this estimates, I'll show you how to work it. But while this is estimating, do you have questions for me? Let me ask that. No questions. I want to log in and talk about your homework real quick. Because the other thing Blayton does that I, I, I kind of appreciate about it, but it takes forever to do, so I get frustrated by it, is it makes model fit a lot easier. It estimates, um, it'll give you a WAIC, I think. <laughs> it'll give you a DIC, right? The model fit, the model comparison to disease. It'll also do the limited information tetrachoric model fit using posterior predictive model checking which is super awesome because now you can tell which items don't work. Um, each of those, just moving back and forth indiscriminately here, where did it go? Did I just close it? No, there it is. Big. But what I'm doing this is because I made another homework. It's your last homework of the semester. It's due uh, December 5th, so you got some weeks on it, right? So it's two weeks if you ignore working next week. I'm not making you work on fall break. Basically, I need you to estimate a model that has um, each math standard as an attribute and then one single ELA attribute. So you can build it to build the Q matrix this way, right? So we're going to do math and ELA simultaneous in estimation here, okay? All the math items will measure just that standard and ELA. So think of it this way, why am I doing that? Well, we don't have the text of the item already, but if any of those items are word problems, this is a model that allows a person's ability in reading to modify their item response for math, which would be important because reading is a non, is what we would call construct irrelevant variance in math. But we're measuring reading, so we could use it. So we're moving in that direction. Uh, I then ask you to estimate a DINA model. Actually, estimate the regular model, and then uh, report some numbers on it, and then change it to the DINA model. Now, the DINA model, you're going to have to figure out the syntax for. But I know you can do it. Because the highest level interaction is the two-way interaction. And we talked about in class what a DINA model looks like from a linear model perspective. What is it? 
What's what's unique about Dina? Do you remember? No main effects, just the higher order interaction. So if you look at the R code that would go into this, which is right here, to make this item Dina, you just don't specify the main effects, and it becomes Dina. The end. Right? I know that sounds silly, but that really emphasizes that, yeah, we probably shouldn't be doing the Dina model. People named Dina are not, are not at fault, though. We can agree with that. So it takes a while to calculate information criteria as well. I wanted to go through this because I want to show you the output. I'm really, like I like the summary I came up with this. It's really neat to see for me at least. But it's taken a while. But the point I'm trying to make is if you want to estimate these models, I would say go to Blatant first. It takes a while, yes, but M plus will take a while too. The homework is built in Blatant to get you to be thinking about how to estimate these models. Yes, we switched to Bayesian. But the output is very familiar. It will look like non-Bayesian output. The only difference is there's a uh, there's um, convergence criteria on each parameter as well, too. But what do you think of DCMs overall while this is estimating? I think they have very specific. Anybody else? Are DCMs confusing to you? <laughs> Sorry. It's all pretty to me. It's my fault. Right? Yeah, uh, pretty close. Nah. Uh, yeah. So if you're using this for like certification, is it not doing like non referencing that you're talking about? And how does that affect what you're actually Well, that's interesting. Um, what it's trying to do is. Um, a normative classification, <laughs> which is insane. I mean, what does that mean? It doesn't make sense. So if you were to do this, you could build this for certification. You could use this as a way of figuring out who's certified versus not. Uh, and you could build other models other or other mixture models for that as well, a discrete uh, latent variable for it. Um, so I would say rather, rather than looking at the use case specifically to certification, anytime you have a cut score in a latent variable model, you could build a, a version of a mixture model, whether it's a diagnostic model, whether it's some other mixture model that will parallel it and do it in a model-based method. Now, does that give you anything better? It depends, I don't know. Uh, what you can say is that the likelihood process in estimating this model seeks to separate groups, which is a different process than what happens when you just have a regular scaling model, which is trying to order people. Um, here, uh, you know, there are ways that incorporate it. You don't see it done very often because a lot of what we end up doing, particularly in psychometrics, whenever we have a cut score, that arbitrary cut score is um, always subject to some debate, right? Why did you draw the cut here versus somewhere else? And it's harder to see that when you fit these models by themselves. I hope that answers a little bit of your question. I'm telling you, we're almost there. Anybody else want to think about this? Anything else you want to talk about while we're estimating here? Anybody leaving town next week? Ames. Ooh, I'm going to Omaha. Also known as Lames. Lames. Is Lame is Ames lame really? Yeah. Uh. Well, my in-laws. Like me in Omaha. I'm going to Omaha this week, next week. So you may not see me again, depending on what happens. I'm, I'm sort of a wanted man in Nebraska. It's, my time there didn't go well. I'm just kidding. I think I'm. I think I'm, I've made it to where I can in, safely enter and exit the state. And whatever I'm wanted for is not because of legal issues. It's just a lot of angry people at me that, that happens. Ask me about my Nebraska days. It was not a good experience. Anyway, I'm waiting. Chicago that you wanted to stay away from. 
I st I'm running out of places to go to. That's my problem. <laughs> what kind of trouble are you getting into? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. The, now might not be the most appropriate time to discuss that. You're good. But, uh, yeah. I was just like Nebraska. I don't understand Nebraska. <laughs> so I used to work at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. That's where it starts. Oh, okay. I moved there following five years at the University of Georgia. And the setup to move there, I was supposed to first move into their, their version of our program, which is called QQPM. Uh, and that I had to turn that down because of sort of shenanigans with the offer, I'll say, just leave it there. So they were able to, so Lisa, I was moving to live with Lisa, and they wanted to keep her there. She was faculty in psychology. And that dual body problem is very difficult to solve in academics. And so I told them, no, not gonna take the job. It was. Uh, I was going to be assistant professor, and I was already associate with tenure, and I was going to I was going to have a pay cut. So I said no. Next year, they try again, but in psychology, different different part of campus, different college altogether. Now I'm associate professor, but no tenure, so I gave up tenure, and I had a pay cut also, and I also doubled the number of classes I taught. So I felt I was sort of feeling a little bitter by it, and then that sort of. The, the whole process of coming there sort of tainted the water for me as well. So I lasted all of a year and a half. I lived left in the middle of the academic year to leave. That's how quick I wanted to get out. And other universities were like, we'll give you tenure. That's no big deal. So that's what happened. And then no shorter than like five years later than that, I was being interviewed for this job. So I went from being, I can't get tenure to being like distinguished professor in five years probably shows you why there's academic jobs are sort of weird and the interview process is grueling and difficult but that's that's that so it's almost done so I'm just filling time here I know I shouldn't have done this I should have had it prepared I'm sorry anybody else want to talk so when it comes to M plus estimation I know that there's an option where you can change the number of cores that uses to compute yes Well, the problem, so here's the problem. When you, when you live the multiple cores compute, if you think the structure of the algorithm, in our algorithms, we have to be able to compute things simultaneous that aren't dependent on each other. And let's just take a look at what we have in our psychometric model. So if we did the E, e step, right, each person we could separate because the people are independent. So we could do that. So let's split up our people, run them on multiple cores, but then we need to bring it back because now we need to keep every person's theta involved because now we can separate items to the M step. The problem is the overhead it takes to do the, the bring back, pushing out, bringing back, pushing out usually takes longer, depending on the system, depending on the architecture, than it takes to run the whole thing through. And because our algorithms have to iterate on people and on items, that's, that's a problem. <clears throat> so it's just how to run the flash files. I found it that way. Um, I think there's probably some combination of the size of the analysis, like the number of observations or the number of items where it might trip it into something that becomes more efficient eventually, but I'm not sure where that would be. Good question. Blayton will run faster. Each core is a Markov chain, and each core right here is doing posterior predictive checks. So it is built in. All that stuff, remember when Stan and I was like, oh, you gotta do posterior predictive checks, and sometimes Stan will do it for us and some won't. Blayton does it all, in theory, if it works. Now watch, there'll be an error on my own program. 50 or more warnings. Well, that's not an error. No, the warnings here were because of the what it was handling with, um, oh boy. All right, let's see if it's still working. Yeah, it did. All right, so to get the summary, you don't stick it in a summary function. This is an R6 object like you get with um, uh, like your stand files. Like for, you use CMD stand R uses R6 objects. So here you just put a dollar sign and use the summary function. But I built the output to look a lot like Levon. In fact, I ripped off. Levon's open source. So I'm going to openly admit with attribution. Now, even in the file it says liberally borrowed from Levon. Found their source, did this. But here is what we have. Um, tells you the algorithm number of parameters and so forth, you get an estimate of DIC or AIC, WAIC. It'll also tell you 
posterior predictive model checks. Like this is like of the number of items that you have, how many, um, I didn't go much into PPMC here. So this basically, if you have a, a tetrachoric correlation that's um, the, the, the PPMC version of it doesn't include the actual observed tetrachoric, it flags it and it tells you at 109 flagged out of 351. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's just a summary of it. But here's our item parameters, right? For the first item, mean, these are all logits, right? The mean is the EAP estimate of the value from the Markov chain. The SD is the posterior standard deviation. You remember the highest density posterior interval? That's the interval that has the, the middle 95% such that it's uh, the most smallest. That gives you the interval there. And the PSR off is the, um, what is it, uh, something scale reduction factor, potential scale reduction factor, the R hat, Gelman and Rubin's R hat. So you want this number to be all around one. Clearly it doesn't do that. It actually tells you the biggest PSRF of all the numbers. You wouldn't expect this. I ran a sample of literally 100 iterations, right? So um, you wouldn't expect it. But you get all this out. My notation is this. for It separates everything by item. It gives you the effects afterwards in the language that R would. So this, if you were to do this, if item 14 was just a logistic regression that you ran with the GLM function, your output table would have intercept V2, V5, and V2 colon V5. This just appends it with the item it goes with as well too. And then um, you've got a bunch of other features here. So here's a latent variable interaction. You know, look, that interval contains zero, so we probably would say it's not necessarily there, but this is an interesting interaction because it indicates that um, your likelihood of answering a correct item, uh, this item correctly, is, is slightly less than both of the components of the main effects. So it's like an over-additive model a little bit, or under-additive, I mean, this is, it sort of comes in, it's almost like um, a bit non, on, on moving toward the non-compensatory world, if we think of it that way. Remember last time we talked about how these interaction terms are like our, our gauge of, in, of, of um, uh, compensatory versus non-compensatory, right? The DINA model is non-compensatory, it has a positive interaction and zero values for the main effects. So, now all of this is with the constraint that the main effects have to be positive and the interactions, uh, all the constraints we worked out last week. There's something called a constraint matrix this works on. So it will sample values, it'll test it based on a constraint matrix to see if it, all the constraints are met. If not, it'll just reject those and resample them. Uh, that's what's taking so long. But the other thing you can tell here is like, take a look at this main effect. The lower bound of this interval will not go below zero for the main effects because they're bound by zero, right? So when you see a main effect with a lower bound that's close to zero like this, again, these are not converged, so we wouldn't put much stock into it. But if you see that, that is indicating that that main effect's a good candidate to basically potentially remove from the model. And when you remove a main effect from the model, if it doesn't have an interaction involved with it, it's like modifying your Q matrix, right? It's like taking an item, taking a, a one out of the Q matrix, right? In this case. Question. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. In practice, um, seeing a zero there is very rare. Like seeing something even that close to zero is very rare. Normally what you'll see is the main effects will likely all be positive and, and if the model fits, it doesn't, if the model doesn't fit. When the model fits well, you start to see it, but getting the model to fit is hard sometimes. Uh, so I would, I would look at this and anything that has in the zero, zero to point one area, I'd probably say, yeah, that main effect is potentially very small and maybe even not even possible. And finally, <clears throat> at the very end, is our joint probability. Remember this? This is the structural model. This tells you all of the probabilities for the structural model. You'll need that. Because one of your homeworks is to turn that into tetrachoric correlations. Yep, there it is. Right there. But I've given you the breadcrumbs on how to do that. Breadcrumbs mean, you know that reference? Was it, uh, what's the show? Hansel and Gretel? Yeah, I was going to say, like, the, I they just put hand breadcrumbs to find their way back, but the birds ate it and they got lost, and I don't know. 
German? Is that a German story? They got lost in the forest. Sounds about right. What, what tries to eat them? There's an old lady. Oh, that's right. Like she she to to in the house. Always an old lady. That's, uh, but, but then you like. Yeah, she feeds them. She's fattening them up so she needs Oh, gosh. Yeah, okay. So, so <laughs> wow. This has become <laughs> this has become a really. <laughs> So all of this is irrelevant. My hope is that you're able to estimate this model. You'll know this is going to take a while. So, but the the good thing about blatant is it will not take a while to build the the, the syntax for it. It should work fairly quickly. The hard part with blatant is letting it run for a while. But I believe I installed blatant on your Aptainer image on Argon. Uh, if not, you know how to install packages on that image in Argon. So you can install Blatant from there as well. Okay? Um, other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so the, when, when you talk about these model field statistics, you mean those WAC? Uh, yeah, that. Okay, but those are relative model field indices, not absolute model field. I would also take these right here, the posterior predictive model check. Um, What's the meaning of those things? For example, the median total univariate PMs. <laughs> what's, what's that? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So an M plus is the tech 10 output. Oh, you remember that? Yes. Let's go to it right so here. There we are checking the discrepancy between the univariate and bivariate tables. That's right. And at the end of the table, it has a sum. Yes. In blatant, that's what that is mirroring. This is the sum of the bivariate chi-squares. So a model will fit better if this is smaller, if you compare between models. Yes, okay, great. Now, about the scale of those results, is that logit? They're all logits. Great. Finally, uh, can you go back to the instructions, please, for our homework? Because oh, for yes. me, this step one is weird. I cannot understand that. Uh, but basically, we will be using two attributes which are the combination of the standards we have. Is that correct? Not quite. Um, you have to think of your standards as being either math standards or English language art standards. Yes. Okay? The math standards leave as is. The, each of those is an attribute so long as they have more than th three or more items that they measure. Some of your data sets are a little weird. They have, a standard that measures one item or two items, right? So, so you may have four math standards. You know, standard one, standard two, standard three, standard four. Those are the, the math attributes. Then create one reading standard. Okay? On the items that are ELA only, that is the only attribute that measures them. Right? So your Q matrix will be zeros for all the math and a one for ELA. And then the items that are math, there will also be a one for ELA. And the reason for that, think of it this way. We are measuring, because on the reading items, we're measuring reading directly. There's nothing else being measured. But on the math items, if we pretend these are word problems, these are math problems that have reading involved in it, we should be using a person's reading ability to control for how their math works on those items. So that's what's going to end up happening. And I'm building it that way because I'm running out of time in the semester, but I really want to get to talking about the ideas of joint modeling in, in what we do in day to day that we could be doing right now in large scale K-12 assessment. We separate separately model math and reading, and we don't have to do that. We shouldn't do that, but we can. So that's what I'm trying to win. Did that answer your question? A little bit. I think that that I must look at the at the Q matrix to see what's the thing that I should have. But I, we can talk about this later or yeah. maybe next Friday. Yeah, that will work. Thank you. Other questions? So it seems like that reading standard that we're creating, you're just going to have a one for all the items. That's right. That's right. Now you might think there's another model that looks like that, the bifactor model. But the bifactor model doesn't directly, like the bifactor always appears with the subfactor. And on the ELA only items, there's no subfactor. It's just ELA. So when you look at that that Q matrix, what you're thinking is a person's 
ability of reading is going to impact only the reading items. But a person's reading and math ability might impact the math items. And what we should see, potentially, if the model fits, good luck seeing if it fits, is for the items that aren't word problems, you probably won't see a big effect of reading on them. Like the main effect should be small, the interaction should be small, shouldn't be anything. But if the word problems involve a complicated set of text, we might see an effect of reading on those items, and we should be controlling for that. Otherwise, we've got differential item functioning on math items based on reading ability, because it's non-construct relevant variance to me. But you don't think about that, but we could look for that, right? How many math tests have word problems? Like all of them, right? We should probably control for someone's ability to understand the text in addition to the math. But we don't do that. But we spend time talking about construct relevant rate, but now I'm on a rant. Never mind. I can answer your question. Good. Rant, rant, rant. That's all I do. Complain. At least I didn't say any bad words about my computer. Not not that much. I said it shot the bed. I guess that's pretty bad. Oh, that's right. My colleague. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what other things do you want to talk about? We're, out, we're done for today. Uh, here, let me give you some ideas. I have office hours this Friday, just this Friday. Next Friday during fall break, there will not be office hours. So if you try to join Zoom after Thanksgiving or after, you know, on next Friday, I won't be there, I promise. Okay, I'm gonna be in Omaha. I might rather be there. Don't, oh shoot, that's on Zoom, on YouTube. I'm just kidding. I'm, I actually have good in-laws. I actually do like my in-laws. I so. like my in-laws too. I just don't like yours. <laughs> I just want to. I just want to put that out there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so next Friday we'll not have office hours. We'll have class the week following that. The homework is still not due yet. So if you try homework a little bit between now and next class, that's where I'm at. Bring your questions. November 29th is the next class. We'll have that. No class next week. Okay. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for being here. And I uh, hope you got something out of it.